Okay, so today, this morning, we'll talk a bit about uh, uh, ontology. This is the next step uh, after the modeling with the RDF and RDF schema. Uh, if you want, uh, while, we, while I'm talking, okay, you may start in the background to install a protege, uh, which we will be using to, for the examples, uh, and uh, for this class and for the next one, so, which is the, let's say, the main, uh, or the most important, or probably the only editor for ontologies that you have over there. It's, the, it's a project developed uh, since many years by Stanford University with uh, the global funding <coughs> uh, all over the world. There are other ontology editors that are commercial, uh, but this one is uh, more than good enough for us. Mm -hmm. It's a bit complex to use, but uh, we use it for examples and, uh, and see how it works. So, uh, probably one of the uh, words that are concepts that are mostly associated with semantic web uh, is that of ontologies. Okay. In a sense, uh, people, a lot of people think that semantic web and ontology are more or less the same thing or the same uh, concept. Uh, actually, what we try to do is to show you that even with simple RDF, uh, we already can do a lot of things. Okay, all the linked data universe uh, and, uh, and the querying and so on doesn't require higher levels uh, of formalism uh, or higher levels of, of logics uh, like those uh, that are brought by, uh, by our ontologies. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if we want or, or if we need uh, to add, uh, to move to stronger semantics, uh, uh, we, of course, need uh, to use something which is more complete, more expressive than just uh, RDF or RDF schema. With RDF schema, we saw that we can more or less declare uh, class hierarchies, but uh, we cannot exp mm, express any constraint over those. You cannot say, okay, if I have uh, a, an object of type uh, uh, no, a car, uh, and a car is a class, then every object of that type should have a minimum set of attributes or should not have some kind of attributes. We, you cannot do that. It's, uh, it's all very, very free, which is the power of RDF. So you can, we, we can mix information from DBpedia, from that, from other sources, and you, you will never get an inconsistency because there is no notion of consistency, by, <laughs> by the way, in RDF. It's uh, just, just data that is merged together and can be queried. Uh, next time we see that uh, even in RDF you can also do something a bit more than just querying a data set, you can apply a bit of reasoning over that. Huh? But we see that the reasoning on RDF is very off. It's not, I wouldn't say poor, but uh, it doesn't deliver interesting results. Why in, uh, when we move uh, to higher level semantics, of course there's a larger effort in modeling information we can express more information, more knowledge, and then <coughs> sorry, we can also gain more insight after uh, we run a reasoner. Hmm? Um, so ontologies are just one of the many levels uh, of representation of uh, information representation. Hmm? Maybe we, we saw something of this uh, on the first day. Um, I, I have this slide medically to remind ourselves. Uh, uh, not to overshoot hmm, when we try to uh, when we are trying to model some information. So don't make it more complex than you really need. Hmm? I would say just enough semantics uh, is what you need. So uh, ontologies are good, are powerful tools. Uh, there are powerful reasoners uh, and editors and so on, but uh, they require a lot of structured design, a lot of uh, um, a priori uh, say investment. Uh, and uh, they are not so easy to interpret with other data sources. Maybe in your case, uh, uh, something lighter is, uh, is sufficient. So also using the same technologies. So for example, we, we don't have time to see all of them, but for example, maybe a taxonomy is enough and there are RDF schemas and, and vocabulary for describing taxonomies. If, if that is what you need, you don't need to move up to a full ontology. Hmm? But today we are we want to con convince ourselves that uh, we need something more than RDF or RDF schema. So this is a, an example of what we had last week. So just triples, uh, and uh, some of these uh, triples are part 
of the schema so they describe not individual facts or relationship about uh, uh, instances but they try to give classes uh, and uh, the qualities of uh, relationships uh, so teaches is a relationship between two uh, items uh, and these items should uh, could well, not should because you cannot forbid anything else uh, uh, should belong to these classes hmm? and this is another example where actually RDF schema is limited to these two, two actually constructs uh, how to define some classes and how to define properties that's it mm -hmm. the notion of type is born with RDF schema but nothing nothing really more and uh, we soon discover that RDF schema is too weak uh, to constraints or to describe properly the information that we have mm. um, we'll see I, I don't want to make the list here we'll see what we can do with the uh, uh, ontologies that actually there's a, a totally no way uh, of doing with the um, with the RDF schema uh, so how did they design uh, the OWL, all uh, language, uh, which is actually the language that we use for describing ontologies in the semantic web. First of all, uh, we want to build upon RDF. So, it should, uh, shouldn't be a surprise that uh, an ontology is still an RDF document. So, everything in all is expressed as RDF classes. We just add a specific dictionary, a vocabulary, with more predefined uh, meanings so like the for rdf schema we add we gave a meaning to the rdf s dot class, uh, class or uh, property classes where, where they were just any name you can define but it, it was name whose meaning was standardized in rdf schema the same we do with all we define all semicolon some a lot of uh, classes and properties and we give meaning to those mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we want to do that uh, by exploiting what was it uh, six years or more of study in artificial intelligence so there's a lot of mathematical models a lot of log formal logic and so on or that people have already been studying and so we don't want or people who invented all didn't want to invent uh, a new formula they just used uh, something which is already known from the mathematical point of view but uh, usually was just confined uh, to a smaller group of people that could use only some specialized tools uh, to use that, that specific form no? there was a problem of fragmentation of people creating their own uh, version of the uh, of um, let's say um, mathematical formulas and tools that can use them and here they were trying to bring some order so okay let's exploit that uh, formalism but make it more easy to use uh, because we are integrating that with the web with rdf and with a lot of uh, tools that can be shared mm -hmm. so at the same time we should have a formal specification language but uh, doesn't require to be mathematicians to understand so that's another problem if you read a lot some papers about formal systems you really get lost and, and unless you have a very strong mathematical background for years of study in the specific domain here what you want to do is to exploit that formal layer but give it uh, a, 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 an easy to use uh, interface let's say something that a, a programmer or a computer scientist can use without uh, really understanding what's going on but but trusting that they understand what they are doing and most of all uh, we are doing the effort of modeling information with a stronger let's say emphasis just because or mainly because uh, after that after we model with ontologies we can exploit uh, uh, reasoning algorithms so some algorithms that can actually extract information that is not made explicit um, so that was uh, the design goals of the old language right now we are describing the version 2 old 2 language which is an extension of the first one that came uh, at the beginning and um, what does it contain well basically basically uh, an ontology uh, contains a set of facts that we assume to be true 
is more or less what, what we did in, uh, in RDS. Uh, they are called uh, um, actions. Now we are stating some facts. We don't care whether they are really real or really true, but in the context of the ontology, what we write is treated as an action. If the designer of the ontology writes uh, that uh, uh, a cat has three legs and not four, that's true in the context of the ontology containing that fact. So everything we write explicitly is, uh, is not up for discussion. Huh? It's true by definition. And um, we want this action to represent uh, some uh, uh, entities that may, 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 have, may have a representation in the real world. Hmm? Uh, so we are trying to combine together these, these facts uh, in a, 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 a larger system of facts uh, that tries uh, to describe even complex uh, um, information that should be able to model something uh, in the real world. Um, okay. Um, we must, uh, you know, clarify what we what what's the truth level, let's say, uh, that we can assume from an ontology. Uh, for example, we when we speak about something, we can describe, we can say, you know, informally, that something is true or false. Okay. And this would be true or false in our understanding of the world. Okay? So if I say that this room is very large, probably it's a false statement. Okay? Unless you, you lived all your all of your life in a coffin or something like that. But uh, uh, in when we are modern ontology, we actually don't care about uh, a, a given statement being really true or not. Okay? Um, we just want to reason about whether a given information is consistent or is it or more is implied by other known facts. So this is the notion of entailment, which is mentioned here, so that we have a set of known facts, facts that are Action. So I assume them to be true. I will never check with the real world whether these facts are true. And in the ontology, what I'm trying to do is to, uh, to discover new facts uh, that uh, will be true if all the other actions are also true. So we have a notion of truth which is conditioned by the information that we put into the ontology. So I can create totally uh, imaginary world where nothing is real or real in the sense of the real world, but is nevertheless totally consistent. Hmm? Uh, we start from some initial statements, we treat them as true by definition, and we try to check which other new statements uh, can be deduced, inferred. The word here is entailed, which is a very strange word, um, uh, from the existing one. So actually, if you are, have an ontology which already describes some information and a new fact, it may happen that this new fact uh, is consistent with the previous ones. So it can be added without creating logical inconsistency inside the given fact. It doesn't contradict uh, any known uh, information. So if I'm saying that all the all cats have three legs, uh, which is not true in the human sense, but is perf perfectly valid uh, inside an ontology, well, it would be inconsistent to say that, for example, chicken are cats. <coughs> because a chicken has two legs. It wouldn't be strange in general to say that a chicken is a cat in an ontology. I wouldn't do that because maybe it would make the ontology useless for interpreting the real world. But it can be. Unless I already say that all cats have, have three legs and all chickens have two. So at that point, a chicken cannot be a cat because there is a conflict 
of, with other information that they have about chicken and other information that they have about chicken. Of course, we try to model something useful or something real, okay? But this is just to make the point that uh, we are talking about formal reasons. Facts that can be fit together in a given imaginary world or cannot be fit together because actually they are saying uh, uh, contrasting information, okay? Um, okay. So what are the ingredients, the components that we use to create uh, uh, well, the first part is very, very much similar to what we already could do with RDF schema. Classes and instances. So we have defined classes of objects and individuals, individual instances uh, inside the ontology. By the way, there is a much stronger separation between classes and instances, you know, in all rather than in RDF. In RDF, uh, a class could also be an instance for another relationship. In all, this is forbidden. These are, they are separated, they are disjoint, in order to avoid uh, um, paradoxes. You know the paradox of uh, the barber that shaves everybody in the city except those that shave themselves and so on, that are statements that can be constructed but cannot be true nor false at any time, okay? Because they are, they are outside the, the rule of simple logic. And uh, all that was constructed, most of it at least, uh, to uh, forbid you from creating this kind of space. And then we have properties. Properties again are in uh, like in RDF, so they are linked to different uh, nodes. Uh, we have two types of pro properties. Here they call them opt properties and data type properties, depending on the range of the property. So a property always applies to a node. And on the other hand, so the, the range, the destination of the property may be an object, could be a class or an instance, or maybe a da uh, simple data, literals. But, uh, can be more than literals, but basically the distinction is one. So we distinguish between these two. Of course, data type properties are, are lighter, are not, uh, not much in interesting. Object properties are the ones that, that be build the, the semantics. And, uh, Adding information always means uh, removing possibilities. Adding more information means uh, adding some constraints. I know that uh, uh, cats have three legs, uh, so I'm removing the possibility of a cat with four legs, with five legs, with 27 legs. Okay, we are, we, are, uh, we are in an open world, okay? So initially, everything is possible. Everything is possible. If I have some information about the world, I will state what is impossible. A lot of many things that are not allowed, not possible in this world. And so I'm creating, I mean, I'm shaping the world by taking away what is not uh, real. Okay, in many types. So uh, that's why uh, actually the semantic information comes into the form of restrictions. Forbid forbidding something means uh, having more rules about uh, how objects can interact with each other. And so in a way, it's providing more information. So it's a bit strange way of thinking. Usually we think that we forgive information, we give more. Actually, we, every bit of information that we give reduces the number of possibility of possible instances of different properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are the basic uh, oh, annotations are there for software engineering, let's say, stuff. Uh, but they're not part of, really of the semantic model. So these are the key concepts. And these uh, were put together by distilling, let's say, several formal methods, formal models, that more or less they all used uh, the same concept, even if they called them in different ways. So they were, uh, we will see that there is a, still a, a shift of terminology well, the same concept was is called in different ways because it came historically from uh, different sources. You see that all uh, comes uh, from the synthesis of many other uh, ontology languages that were pre-existing here, XOL, SHOW, ML, OIL, and so on, and they were put together and uh, uh, subsumed in the, in the standard uh, OWL. So there are, there's a bit of each of those uh, into our 
ontology language. Uh, okay, with that, uh, just just to see the timeline here, um, it was first um, let's say published officially in 2004 and was revised in 2009. So it's sort it's a it's an historically sound language. It doesn't have a, a much. Uh, it doesn't have a quick development cycle because, after all, it's mathematics, and so that doesn't need to change uh, uh, so often or so much. Okay, but there was a significant region between version one and um, version two. Um, what does it do more than RDF schema? Well, uh, identity. Uh, what we were saying in RDF is that. Uh, the same real object can be represented by different URIs. So the URI about me, I could choose one URI, one identifier. You could choose a different identifier, but you were also trying to refer to me. So we had different identifiers that were was referring were referring to the same uh, real object, but we had no way of stating that. So in RDF, when you see two different identifiers, you always ask yourself, uh, do they refer to the same person or say, person, entity, object, or not? You never know. Okay? In uh, uh, all, uh, you can explicitly say, these two refer actually, they are the same, that's a concept called same as, or they are different. So you can, I tell you that they are different. So you are not allowed to treat them as the same. Or I tell you that these two are the same. Again, just to link to the previous talk, uh, if I tell you some more information, these two identifiers are the same. Well, they are not the same identifier. They refer to the same object. We are deleting from our world all the possibilities where these two identifiers refer to different objects. So again, we are adding constraints, removing possibilities, means adding information. And uh, this is for instances, same or different, or for classes. Classes, these two class, classes are equivalent. So if I'm calling something, uh, I don't know, um, a school, and something else, uh, a college, for example, well, it may happen that these two names came from different uh, ontologies, made from different people, but they actually refer to the same concept. So we can say that uh, these two classes are equivalent. Equivalent classes, we say that means that they have the same members, the same instances. Okay? And which may have very strong, uh, let's say, consequences. And uh, uh, classes are generators of objects, like in object oriented programming. They are also containers of objects, like in uh, um, set theory. They are also rules for, a class is a rule for detecting or for deciding which object, which object belongs to the class or not, like in logic. In logic, when you, make, when you write a logic proposition, you are writing a statement that may be true or false. And you have an object, mm -hmm. and say, okay, does the object satisfy this logical property? Like an equation. If it satisfies, then it, th this object belongs to the class. So we can treat classes as classes in the programming language, as sets, uh, as logical statements, and they are all the th these things at the same time. And so if we may do intersection, union, complement, and all the operations that we do with sets. Or if we want to see them from a logical point of view, we can do and, or, or complement on the logical expression. Okay? And we can do these operations in many cases even without knowing, or better, before knowing the elements of the class. So if you have two sets, uh, you need to declare these sets. Then you can copy the intersection. With classes, you can declare the intersection of two classes before knowing the element that it contains. 
and when this element will appear then the intersection will be let's say computed it's not really computed because we are looking at a declarative language not a procedural language so we say that the intersection will be defined at the same time even if we don't know yet today what are the elements of this class but we know the rules by which the element will belong to this intersection because we know what intersection means and we know the rules for belonging to the first and the second class so it's something that we need to build in this way and um, and okay and then all of this also translates to the properties so we can define that the property may be transitive or is symmetric or two properties are inverse one to another all stuff that we couldn't define in uh, in, uh, in RDF schema and all of this makes sense no? it's uh, we are more or less familiar with these notions uh, from set theory basically or, or basic relations uh, between between sets uh, but uh, it digs into much much deeper mathematics mathematics rather than set theory mm -hmm. so we can use concepts that are quite let's say more or less easy to understand uh, but uh, they are really more complex as they seem and so they they can give us more more information mm -hmm. um, for example with a reader we can check whether a given information is or is consistent or not with the previous information with previously known information so we can be able to construct models that have no contradiction side no information can be contradictory in a valid ontology we can check whether some elements, uh, some instances, belong to some class or not. <laughs> OK, from a programming point of view, you have a class and you create instances out of the class. So you really know which are the instances because you created them. Here we are declaring the, cri the criteria for belonging to a class. Uh, and so we can see later or can let the ontology decide which elements belong to a class for example i could write i could define a class uh, i don't know a good student and we define this class uh, by saying that a good student is one that has you know passed a lot of exams uh, published a lot of papers and uh, have a very good scores these are just rules and the class the classification uh, may analyze which these are operations that the original will do we'll see the next uh, the next class uh, what we, uh, how to use the original but uh, uh, is able to inspect all the elements of type student probably and see which ones also belong to that class that are defined without naming any student but but but, but by defining the rules for belonging to that and this Rules for belonging to that good student class are actually an intersection, an end, a logical conjunction. I require many different properties to be same at the same, uh, to be true at the same time. So that's why uh, we can use this for querying information and for um, and for completing the information that we know. Um, Okay, so this is something that, just for a terminology point of view, we, are, we use class and individual, we tend to use individual instead of instance for making an, an element of a class. And we try to use property instead of relations, mm -hmm. but just from a terminology point of view. Um, okay, maybe let's go to the... Uh, to the actually behavior of, uh, of the language. So, so first of all, uh, always remember that in the semantic web we always have this, uh, the open word assumption, which basically can be said uh, as the truth of a statement is independent of whether it's known, known or not. So something may be true, but we still don't know it. Don't know it. Somebody else may have this information, but we don't have that, so it's always possible that some new true information would be added. So if something is either true or 
not known, not yet known. No, nothing can ever be false. And uh, so new information always adds up to existing information. Even if this new information is contradictory, so if I add this piece of information, everything will collapse, or my model will collapse. Okay. But I, I don't have any way, and so I, I try not to add that. I would have, a, a, a having an inconsistent uh, logical model uh, forbids me to do for doing any kind of reasoning, any kind of queries, because from force everything follows. So we are again throwing away all the information, <coughs> and, um, and but can never we can never remove information hmm? <coughs> in a in an approach. Again, all. Uh, borders from RDF, uh, the possibility of having different names, different identifiers, to refer to the same concept or the same object or to the same uh, individual. We cannot assume that uh, different identifiers uh, represent uh, different uh, individuals unless we specify it later. Okay, we start with this assumption, it's the same as RDF. And this applies both to individuals, which is well, easier to understand, but also to classes. And uh, this is the, the place uh, of, uh, of an ontology in this picture. So what, what do we have? We have an ontology which is uh, in the middle of two different worlds. The lower world, this semantics, direct semantics, RDF-based semantics, are the mathematics. Here we have an ontology that can be translated into a set of logical equations in a given uh, logic uh, formalism, which is mainly description logic, and everything can be proven down there. Okay? So this is a theoret theoretical uh, foundation of, uh, of uh, the language. And uh, on top of that, we have all the uh, tools that can read and write uh, and modify the ontologies. And the ontology actually is an RDF graph with special properties that structure the information in the form of an ontology hmm? using a specific uh, uh, vocabulary. So we are working, let's say, as knowledge engineers on top of that, but we know that everything we write, every uh, trifle we write, uh, really has a meaning. Uh, we are writing equations down there, okay? Even if we don't, we, if we don't understand them. Um, okay. Classes and uh, individuals are um, a class is defined in a very, very generic way, a set of resources that are common, that share common characteristics, uh, <laughs> but we have a more, say, uh, practical notion of classes if you think about a class in a programming language or a set in, a, in the set theory. Uh, and so we can define classes and instances. For example, Ryan and Andrew are persons. So, is a is a relationship, it's a property, it's, a, it's an object property, right now we have the, the correct uh, naming, um, which was already defined at the RDF schema level. RDF type, we already know this property. And uh, these are different resources, if we are talking about RDF, this resource is defined to be a class. So we may, have, we, we may only have two levels of typing in an ontology. We have the top level predefined class object, and uh, every class is an instance, is an instance of this single class concept, and every individual is an instance of a, a class. And we are using just, uh, so for declaring something as a class, uh, we just define it, we, we just use the type statement. Hmm? And uh, we have a clear separation, which was not there in RDF, within this level. Sometimes uh, I like to use this uh, terminology 
that comes from description logic saying that the class which is a predefined OWL semicolon class identifier is a, a, a metamodel. So the rules is it's part of the language itself. It's a resource in RDF, but we treat it as a, as a construct in the language. Okay? Then we have a an intermediate level which is called uh, sometimes a T box, terminology box, where we construct the terminology for our application. We define the terms, the words, the concepts, the classes, and the properties, so the relationship between these classes. This is the describes the rules of the discourse, describes the behavior of the system, independently for, from their own individual. And then we have the assertion box level, the A box level, where we have facts. We have individuals, instances, actions. What? Uh, we think that these are facts, they are actions. This is true. Ryan is a real person, which is a person. At the, at the A level, at the, sorry, at the T level, at the T box level, at the terminology level, we don't have really actions. We have rules, basically. A person has a name. A person can be married to another person. This is a rule. By which uh, facts uh, should uh, be consistent. But the real actions are here at the, at the fact level. Then depending on the purpose of your ontology, you there may have you may have an ontology that only consists of classes, for example. They don't need any instance. When you are maybe defining some taxonomy of ideas or concepts or something like that. Or you, you may have ontologies on the other hand that are very few classes and a lot of instances. Like all the biomedical ontologies and so on, that are, where there are a lot, a lot, a lot really of facts of instances that are listed there. Mm -hmm. uh, so individuals uh, can be members of a class uh, in two ways. One is the easy way. Somebody said that Ryan is a person. Okay, there's a trifle somewhere that Ryan is of type person, is a person. Right, that's it. Or an individual can be a member of a class uh, because the information that they have about the individual fits the, members con the membership conditions declared at the class level. So I can infer that, that that individual is a member of that class. So since individuals are facts, uh, the fact that uh, an individual can, we can discover the belonging of a new individual to an existing class means that we are discovering new facts. Of course, we must, we must be careful. <coughs> Open word assumption. If we don't specify very well or strictly the membership condition, any individual can be member of any class. Okay? Ryan is a person. Is Ryan also a, a vehicle? Is Ryan also an airplane? Yes. Why not? Why not? Because probably we should remember that persons and objects or cars are not compatible, are disjoint classes. They cannot have the same elements. So if you are in one class, you cannot be in the other. But this is a further information that we don't have yet. So, automatic classification is very powerful, but it's also dangerous because it may put any individual into any class where they're not satisfying the membership conditions, means uh, not violating any of these conditions. If, if I don't have enough conditions, I'm fine. I can enter everywhere. I, n I will not be a member of a class only if the class forbids me from entering because of some of my properties. Hmm? So that's, that's the other way around with what we are accustomed to. Um, okay, properties link uh, classes 
And this is something that is uh, probably the most complex uh, conceptual point in, in, in uh, all to understand. A property is declared between classes, but uh, its semantics is applied uh, to individuals. Ryan knows Andrew is a property that I declare that they apply between two instances. Knowing is, is a property between a person and another person. So I will not declare the knows property between th these two people and another knows property between other two people and so on. I will declare one general knows relationship as property, but an object property, because it's trained to another object, between a person and another person. And then I can use this property between the, um, sorry, the um, individuals. Okay, so in this case, we know that Ryan and Andrew are person, persons. Okay, so sorry, I need to draw because I don't have the slide. It's probably later. What we say is that we have a person that has two properties. One property is uh, nose, and another property is name. Nose is a property with range person and so on, and with domain person. Links a person to another person. Name is a property whose domain is person and the range is a string. Nose and name are properties. Like person is a class. Person is a class, nose is a property, name is a property. This is the key box, the declarative part. We are defining person, nodes, names, and they're describing what they are, how they behave. There's a lot to be said about nodes because, for example, it's reflective, it's transitive. No, it's not transitive. No. If I know you and you know somebody else, I don't need to know. And, uh, and so this is the terminology box. At the assertion level, at the A box level, I apply these properties between the individuals. All the this nose property has been defined there with some rules. Okay? And these rules will be applied when the relationship with the property works between individuals. The rule will always be applied to one individual of the domain and one individual of the range of the relation. Okay, we must have this clear when we talk about relationship uh, without about cardinality, about existence, and so on. Hmm? So just keep this in mind. Um, well, we don't care about the syntax for the moment. So, what are the ingredients of an ontology? Well, first of all, an ontology, well, as a declaration, as a name. Well, everything has a name. But more specifically, an ontology uh, should have an identifier. An ontology is a document in the scientific web and should be, we should be able to refer to this ontology. Hmm? 
uh, we can create one while we go okay so for example we can fire up uh, protege yeah and start creating an ontology we we'll try to make maybe a very simple one describing students courses universities and so on which is very very we are very familiar with this concept okay instead of cats and uh, so protege should be starting sooner than later or not doing something okay so we create a new ontology and it tries to give an identifier for me, you say that the semantic auditor slash full view slash ontologies slash entitled ontology 14. Everything on the semantic web must have an SD file. So I can choose one, I can change it, I can change it here if I want. So, for example, would be uh, university ontology. Something like that. This is Active ontology is the header of the ontology, the metadata about the ontology itself. The authors and the date, the creation date, and something like that. Uh, it's all part of this uh, annotation so that we can add uh, to an ontology definition, comment defined by, uh, prior version, and so on. So linking this ontology to other ontologies, to their authors, and so on. We don't care about that for, for a moment until we, we publish that. There is also a notion of, of importing other ontologies. So you, in, your, in your ontology, you can import another ontology that means that you are trusting that everything that is defined there, in that world, let's say in that model, will be also be treated as true in your model. Hmm? So it's a way of, of referring to other ontologies that may, may be all over the internet. You have the address. So we fetch them and include the facts uh, from outside into, into your own hmm? So you don't have to redefine everything if, you are, if there's already something for you. Okay, then, let's do this one. Okay, uh, so you can define the ontology and import other ontologies if you want, but not for, mo for the moment. Uh, Okay, this is an example of annotation so But, well, that's the metadata. We we'll don't spend too much time about uh, trivial things. Then we have the core of ontologies are classes. We can define classes just by defining a name and identifier of type class. Class is not RDF schema class. You see that the prefix is different. It's all class. So this is a different class uh, than the RDF schema class. Actually, it's a subclass of that with more properties, with more, more strict behavior. Hmm? It's a stricter class. It's more powerful, so it has a stricter behavior. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's not so free to use as an RDF schema class. So every class in all must be a member of class. And. Uh, so we can define classes, well, here we have the different syntaxes, but we can do that directly in Protege. For example, if you are talking about a university, uh, defining classes can be done here in the entities. It calls them entities instead of, instead of classes. You, I told you that there's a mix of different uh, terminologies here, okay? Uh, and you can define the class hierarchy. You see that here, we already have one predefined class, uh, which is called thing, all thing, which is the superclass of all the superclasses, like uh, 
object in Java, for example. Okay? So all, all programming language, all object-oriented programming languages already have the notion of the universal superclass. It may be explicit or implicit, depends on, on the language. Okay? Uh, in uh, all is called thing, which is the most uh, general word that you can think of. Okay? Every class uh, is a subclass of thing. Is an object, is a resource of type class, uh, which at the same time is also a subclass of thing. So it's easier to define classes just by subclassing thing. So if you go to thing, you click on the subclass button, you can give the name of a, uh, uh, of a new, you can create a, a new class. So for example, we may have course. And we may have, uh, in a university, you can have uh, students, you can have uh, teachers. But maybe students and teachers are both uh, persons. So we have a class person and a subclass uh, teacher and a subclass student. So in our world, we are describing, we are defining some new terms and saying, okay, we are talking about courses and persons, and these persons could be teachers or students. Right now, we just gave name, but we didn't give any rule yet. Well, at least well, one rule is given, that every student is also a person, and every teacher is also a person. But it may be that uh, a person is both a student and a teacher. This is what happens when you are doing a PhD. You can be a student, but at the same time, you are teaching some other courses. It's not forbidden here. These two subclasses are not disjoint, unless I will say so. Well, the, the, what's uh, uncomfortable is that maybe also a course and a person could be the same individual. And in the real world, uh, it's not possible that a course is a student. No, they are not the same. We should be able to express that, hmm? but not, not, a, not yet. So we can create classes in this way, and uh, um, every time we define a class in the mathematical world, which is, which is behind our feet, there's automatically a set of individuals which are not born yet but are already part of this class so when we call about the class extension it means the extension in terms of extensional compared to intentional intention, um, you can have information up de described in a logical way with a set of statements uh, that describes the logical properties this is an, is an intentional description an extension description is a, a list of the elements that belong, that satisfy the property or that belong to that class. All put this, these two representations together, and every time we define something, we are defining logical statements here. Subclasses are logical statements. We are predicating something about the extensions of these classes, so about the set of, of the individuals that are members of a class. Not may be members of a class, are. Because from the logical point of view, we still don't have any individuals, but potentially, we are in the open world assumption, there may be billions of individuals that are already members of this class, because they are not violating any constraint of this class. Okay, so in a way, we are already talking about billions of people, billions of courses that are belonging to this class. We don't know that yet, but they already belong. Of course, what we want, we want to have a bit more control about the extension of our classes, okay? So we'll put more, more some rules, but we cannot prevent that. And from the logical point of view, everything we are doing, we are doing at the same time to the, uh, the explicit members of the classes, so the courses we are going to list, and to all the implicit, not yet known members of the class. Um, okay. 
So, uh, in order to have a control over, of, or to be able to shape this extension of the class, otherwise every class will extend over the whole universe. No, we want to shape this extension. And for shaping that, uh, we can uh, add restrictions. We already saw one type of restriction, which is the subclass. Uh, but there are also other types of restrictions. Subclassing is easy. Uh, we, we say that one class is a, is a subclass of, a, of another if the element, the extension, the element of the subclass is a subset of the elements of a parent class. Which is also to say that the logical conditions for, to, for belonging to the subclass are stricter than the logical condition for belonging to the superclass. I have more conditions to meet. Every, every, everyone can be a person, but only somebody can be a student. There are more conditions to that. For example, paying the taxes to, to the taxes to the university. And um, let's not confuse subclasses with uh, individuals, of course. A subclass is still a class, uh, so it still represents uh, a billion of possible individuals. An individual is one uh, resource which belongs to the class. You know, in, in ontologies, the, these two levels are always uh, totally separate. Uh, by the way, we already saw the thing class, there's also a nothing class, which is an implicit subclass of every class we define. It's a class uh, that uh, uh, whose uh, so much a subclass that the conditions for belonging are so, so much stricter that nothing can belong there. Okay, we have thing that contains everything, and as we go down in specializing the classes, we restrict the extensions until we find a avoid extension there. So every class will be all, we always live between these two. And um, other other restrictions are properties. Uh, we can define over a class a set of properties that, not the class, but its individuals should possess. Okay? Object properties, or that type properties, uh, the domain in both cases are the classes, and uh, what, the, what changes are uh, the, the range that is another class or a literal. For example, in our ontology, uh, I, we want to say that, for example, a course has a name, and a person also has a name. So having a name is a property, is a data type property, because the name is a literal, it's a string, right? Is the property name, or do we, do we think that the property name of a person is the same as the name of a course. In other words, should I define one property, name, and apply it to both person and course? Or should I define a person name and a course name as two different properties? It's not easy. Well, it depends uh, maybe on the properties of these properties. If we want just to store information, we don't care. But then if we want to search in the courses, well, it's, e it's easier if we have a property which only lists course names. If we want to avoid that two courses have the same name, well, then we must be the property of having the, the course name should be an uh, injective um, function, shouldn't allow duplicates. While the name of a person, we cannot control that. So, if we were modeling objects, uh, yeah. It's a restriction that we apply to the property. Okay. But what I was saying is that this restriction, I want to apply it to the property 
of course is not the property of persons so this I, i'm trying to understand whether these two properties are the same conceptually or they have different characteristics uh, that would bring me to model them to call them in two different ways Let's say it in another way. If we are modeling objects in a programming language, person would have an attribute called name. Course would have another attribute called name. Probably we would never think that these two names should be merged. Right. Or well, let's create a subclass so they can give a name to everything. And so uh, we are, here we cannot define uh, attributes uh, of classes we want we can define properties which live uh, independently from classes we cannot say that this is attribute of this class because that would be closing the world f so we can, we can use uh, the same uh, name for the two we can use different or names we must use different names we should use different names okay. if we want them to be potentially different we must use different identifiers And so we can define how where do we define them into the object properties. Oh, sorry, the data type proper data type properties. Now are there? Uh, tabs. Uh, data properties. What? Sorry. Inst no. Here? Ah, yeah, data types. No, data, uh, data properties here. Okay. Okay, otherwise, there's, uh, you can uh, create new tabs uh, especially for that. I was looking for it here. So, here is the same story. We have a top data property, which is a general data property, and we define a specific data property for course names. So, uh, you can do that, as you said, in the data properties tab here, or you can add in the tabs, uh, you define uh, which uh, top level tabs you have, for example, data properties here. I want to have more space here. So, we create a course name, data property, and I create, uh, for example, person name, data property they start as separate if we want to merge them later we are always in time we just need to say that they are the same class or the same property we, we cannot split them afterwards okay so it's always better to start with different identifiers and then merging them it's easy not the other way around so what a course name is a property and uh, a property is a data property for which we can define the domain and the range you see that the uh, the wording here is not domain but domains plural and not a range but ranges so we can define a domain as the intersection of different other domains and the range is the intersection Oh, sorry, the union of different other ranges. Huh? Because no, anybody can later come and add a new range statement or a new domain statement to an existing property. So it's not, we are not bound to one. Hmm? Right now we start for one. So course name is a, a data property that will apply to course. And the range of this data property is just a string. Uh, uh, literal uh, string down there. Course name, domain, course, range, string.
Okay. Then we can do the same for um, person name. So we have other data pro property for person name. We define the domain, which is a person. And so we'll include all students and teachers, and the range will be again a string. These are data properties. Attaching some data type information to a given instance of a class. We haven't yet created an instance, okay, for the moment. Then we have uh, object properties. Object properties are properties in a way whose range is another object. For example, we can say that uh, a student is enrolled into a course. Okay? So we create an object property, enrolled, enrolled in. Or as students we can say these are two different properties okay we, it's easy because we can read more than one and then complete that so a student is enrolled in the course or a course has some students which is the list of students and the same the course uh, may have a, as a teacher as a teacher while the teacher teaches a course these are for example the relationship that we can have between courses and teachers and students so let's maybe give details for this we define four different properties which are all independent but in some way they are linked to each other so enrolled in is the easiest one a student is enrolled into a course so we should specify the domain of the property to be students uh, the range of the property to be course so domain student and the range is course and about this property we can add other um, restrictions and here we have is this a functional property what is it we, we ask remember our first years in uh, mathematical analysis remember a functional property is a function a property where um, it's a function so different uh, for every x there is only a y for every instance in the domain for every individual domain it may be associated only to one or at most to one individual in the course this is not the case here because we would say that for a student can be enrolled in only one course at most in one course this is not the case because a student can be enrolled in more than one course different if uh, if i had a class uh, a PhD course, for example, or PhD level. So each of you is enrolled to exactly one. No, it cannot be enrolled to two different PhD degrees. That would be a functional property. Because for every individual in the domain, for every student, there can be only one individual in the range, only one PhD degree, to which that student is associated with. 
Okay, so you are limiting the cardinality of the image of the function. Inverse function is the same as the reverse. It means that there cannot be two different individuals in the domain that map to the same individual in the range. It would be an injective function if I'm going both wrongly. It can be inverted because if I know a point in the, in the range, I can deduce one only element in the domain. Which is to say that a course can have only one student. Not true. Maybe for the teachers could be. Well, really no, because there are more teachers for another course. But in, a, in another organization, it could be possible that a, 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 a course has only one teacher. So that would be inverse function. Is this a transitive function? Well, a transitive function is a, is a relationship property. It means that when A is in property with B and B is in property with C, then also A is in property with C. This is not transitive, basically because the range of the domain don't match. So for having a transitive property, you should have a range and the domain to be equal, or to have a significant subset, common subset. Okay, because if a student enrolls in course, and then course cannot be enrolled in what? So you cannot have a concussion. So you, is not transitive, is not symmetric, again, symmetric means if A property B, then B is property A, so we are changing the range of the domain, it's not possible. Um, asymmetric, we don't care because the range is different. Uh, is it reflexive? So an element is in property with itself? No, because it's not even in the range, and the reflexive is the same. So, so it's not there, it doesn't have any special property. We, what we can say, but at the same time, we, we have more information. Inverse of. So we, are, we, desi we design the enrolled property, but we also have a, a property that we call as student. So we say, okay, a student is enrolled in a course. And a course as a student, these two relationships, are the inverse of one child. So every time a student is in a course, then a course has students including that one. So we can declare that, that these two properties are the inverse of each other. Not just uh, they switch domain and range, but every individual that is mapped from one to the other, then it will be mapped back for, for, uh, by the other property. Inverse of as students. So this is everything we know about enroll. We can go and say something about as students. And you see that if we go to as students, uh, it already knows that it's the inverse of enroll. And being the inverse of enrolled, in a way, you should also be aware of the domain. Well, the domain of the inverse property is the range of the first property. And the range of the inverse is the domain of the third one. It's not here explicit. Because right now we are only seeing uh, asserted facts facts that I wrote specifically by hand, by myself. There are a lot of other facts uh, that can be deduced easily by applying a reasoner to this model. We don't know what a reasoner is, so we must wait for that. But we see that there could be other facts that come up when, you, when we will move, uh, when we start a reasoner, it's not started yet, it's not even installed, it's said that the reason down here is not shown, so it's not started, so we don't have this information. But when we will attach a reasoner to our ontology, 
then we will see we may choose to see not just the certain facts uh, but also the inferred one those that are true because i asserted a set of things and there's a logical consequence to the things that result in a new fact that being discovered hmm? not for the moment so for the moment you see that this is stupid yeah just an editor it just records what they write hmm? um, and the same uh, so we i can add them so the what's that has students uh, a course as students uh, range student here i'm just using the simple part i'm picking the domain and the range by choosing one of the existing classes okay if you want to make it more complex huh, there are other ways of creating a a description which is the and or the or or the conjunction or uh, a logical condition okay um, to be applied which are more complex way of saying okay for example all the uh, the range is all the students who have a name starting with f still with but can be done or a naming uh, object description okay or uh, only students uh, who are who have a single given property maybe they are enrolled into this um, phd degree so i can add we well, can create the range or the domain or in general any class or any expression by querying or by specifying the, the properties that a, a student or a course or any a person of any class or must have well not actually the the they are not constrained over the class or the student uh, they are constrained over the individual of that class hmm? but let's keep it simple for the moment so the range will be student and so on for example teaches is something that is inf inverse of as teacher teaches as a uh, teaches a person as a teacher teaches a course and uh, as teacher a course as a teacher some teacher neither of these uh, um, constraints uh, apply to our properties for the moment they are very free properties many to many relationships uh, so there are not many constraints mm -hmm. they are very free um, okay And this, this case, in this way, we are defining very simply the the T box, the, term, the terminology, okay, the domains, range, and so on. We can also have, uh, well, no, it's not in our case, uh, uh, sub properties. So a property which is a subset uh, of a more general property. For example. We have, uh, for example, the enrolled in. That gives you some information. The student is enrolled in a course. But maybe being be enrolled in a course uh, at the master level is different from being enrolled in a course at the PhD level. There may be different rules. So we can imagine that this enrolled in property could have two different sub properties. Enrolled in master, enrolled in PhD course, and we can have different restrictions on the domain, on the range. Maybe we can have uh, 
only some PhD courses. PhD course on, or a master course. Here. And we can say that if you are enrolled in a master course, the, um, being enrolled in a master course uh, uh, constrains the range of the property. So I took course and I made two subclasses, PhD course and my MC, MS course, master course. This means that the, at the property level, I can take a role and add two sub-properties. Enrolled in, in PhD and enrolled in MS. Finished. So we have sub-properties. A sub-property already inherits everything from the separate property is not written here because it's not explicitly asserted but can be easily reasoned but I can add a new restriction to the range so a student is enrolled in a course but a student is enrolled in, enrolled in PhD to a PhD course not any course but the PhD course, for example, range, so it's more limited to PhD course, for example. So we are specializing, we have a, a, very, a more specialized version of it being enrolled. Hmm? And so we are you now describing, like we, we said, I said before, we're describing the rules, how things work. We could say that for enrolling into a PhD course, the student should be a PhD student. So how do I define a PhD student? I can define a subclass. Let's make it implicit for one for once. I can define, let me define um, a proper a data type property over a student, which is the degree level. Okay. And assume that this degree level applies to students and is a string name. It's not very clever choice, but just to make the example. So in this degree level, we can write PhD or master. That's a property that we are attaching to student. Nothing more. A data type property, very simple. Then what we can say in the ontology is that we can create a subclass of students like as a PhD student what is the rule for being a PhD student? student of course you must be a student subclass but also you must have a data the, the property degree level of your, of your individual should be PhD. So we are defining that a PhD student is a subclass of student, not a, any subclass of student, but subclass of student where, where the students, the individuals of their student class, have a degree equal to PhD. So we, I make it the intersection of two different domains. The domain of all the students and the domain of all the individuals, they should be probably students, who have, who have a degree equal to PhD. So I create a subclass of intersection with a data restriction in this case. I only want those individuals whose uh, 
degree level is uh, what is that? Uh, in this case, I say uh, it has a degree level after. For the for the value we must add another box. So we are trying to describe things that we come back to, to this sum uh, assets. We can describe classes that contains um, that will contain individuals based on some rules and not just based on the explicit uh, assertion. Um, okay, inverse properties, joint properties. This is something that we already saw in the example. Let's go to individuals. Okay, this. Um, So, pro properties, okay, the two main pro uh, restrictions of a property are uh, the range of the domain. But as we saw, we can define more object types, object restriction, and data restriction, and so on. And this can be of different types. Uh, so, this makes okay, the, the, the relationship uh, smaller, okay, can be applied to a, a lower number of elements. And uh, this is basically uh, applying the quantifiers, so the for all or at least quantifiers to the relationship. So, for example, um, we say that the easiest one is the sum of sum, sum values from. We say that uh, we have a property and we can restrict this property, for example, in the range, to individuals uh, who have uh, at least one relationship with. So some value from means that uh, um, you are an active student, I could define a class of active students, if you are enrolled in, in at least one course. So we are restricting the class of students uh, based on a property of how the individuals of that class, uh, on whether the individual of the class have or don't have a relationship, a property of that type. So for example, an active student is a student who has some values from enrolled in. Or I can say that uh, um, has value is what, is what we were trying to do before, as value of the property is specifically PhD. So you must, you must be enrolled in a course, and that course must, uh, should be a PhD course, and so on. So you are adding uh, constraints all over, you are restricting classes. And uh, the same with, with cardinality, it's easy to see. But I want to go to individuals. Okay. So there are some rules, of course, we don't have you know, the time to, to learn all of them, no? uh, but just to give an idea of this construction level. We will have another class explicitly for how to construct an ontology. Okay, so it will be more practical. Uh, so the T box uh, is basically declared names, subclasses, properties, relationships between properties, and restrictions about classes and properties. The rules. Then we have the instances. Instances can be uh, described in different ways. For example, here, individuals by class, we, are, we can define 
some teachers, for example. In the teacher, we can add an instance here. So for teacher, you see that, instances for teacher, we can create another one here. For example, it's me. Or it can be Laura Farinetti. We are both teachers, for example, in general. So we see the instances of this class teacher. If we go to person, we don't see them. We know that teachers are persons, at least in our in this model. But it's not being inferred yet. If we go to the class teacher, we see all the instances of this class. And if we go to the class student, we can also have uh, student one, several instances, student two, student three, and so on. What, what can we do with individuals? Well, individuals may have, or well, they belong to a class. In this case, I already positioned these individuals in some specific class. If I don't know where to put them, I could put them at the top level on the thing, and then the reader would try to classify them in the proper place. And then individuals can participate to the properties, to the relationships. So I know that uh, at the personal level, I defined uh, some properties. So that the person has, what is that? As a property enrolled. Sorry, I don't see it here because I'm not reasoned. Per, which are the person that, uh, what, what are the, sorry, data type properties, person name as the domain person. So it means that every instance, which is an instance of person or a subclass of person, can have this uh, um, person name data type property applied. So, for example, if I take myself as an individual, I can add the, here some data property assertion or object property assertion. So I know that every person has a name. Okay, so what is the name of that specific individual? And so this again, I'm asserting that the person name of this individual is a string, which is my name. You, you see RDF working. Every time I click something, I already have a subject, and I define a property and an object. It's all trifles all the way down. And every restriction that has been defined on the person name uh, property will be checked on this instance when we run the reasoner. Right now we're just a certain fact. We don't know yet, until we reason the model, we don't know whether this is consistent or inconsistent, if you're making mistakes or not. And the same for the courses, for example. So I'm taking the instance of course, uh, I must create a new instance, individuals, No, I don't want that. 
the individual for entities, of course. Oops, no, uh, individuals here. Yeah. Why don't do I do that? I want to see the individual for course here. Yeah, by class, sorry. The other tab here. Uh, so, course. I will add uh, the semantic web course. And this course will have an, a, a name also, for example, data property, course name, semantic web. <coughs> so, fill in data type property. These are, from the mathematical point of view, the actions that you are giving to the model. Something that is true <coughs> because we, we say that. And the rules that we define at the T level are being applied to these facts uh, that we are defining at the A level. And then object properties. For example, who is the teacher of this course? So again, we can have the um, this course which is uh, taught by a teacher so this uh, we ask us if I'm trying to add an object property he asks me about the property taught by or what was the name no, as teacher was called as teacher Pull your corner, for example. And then you may have more than one as teacher. Laura Frenetti. I am being careful to write the object properties that are specific for this class. Okay? Right now, if I try to add an object property which is not defined in this domain, it won't give me any error yet. Okay? Right now we still are blind in a way. And so uh, I would expect to see, but I will not, that uh, <coughs> on the other hand, uh, I should say that Udio Corno teaches a course which is the opposite. Since we have two different uh, relationships and that the inverse of each other, I could say, I, I would expect to discover that I am teaching this course because somebody said that that course is taught by me. That will come in your reason. This is what we are saying. Now, expelling in the A box a set of rules uh, as much precise as possible in order to be able to populate the A box, uh, the abstraction box, uh, with new facts uh, as we go. Um, okay, we, we don't, I don't want to be too boring on the syntax. So I, I will stop here. I, I no, I want just to see what's the final effect of all of this. So we have been modeling stuff here. And sooner or later we can save it. And uh, we can save in different formats. Artifact XML or Turtle, one of the many no, different formats. The default is XML, of course. University ontology. <coughs> or then we may have a look. Uh, we can also save it in Turtle. So we can have a look uh, at the documents where I save it, just to see 
Why is that? University in turtle format. No, it's not twenty seven. No, it's not good for the one for today. Sorry. Okay. This is the this is the result of the work we did today. It's an ontology, it imports a lot of namespaces and it declares itself. I am identified with this URI and I am an ontology. Then it declares uh, object properties. This property is enrolled in, is an object property, a sub property of top, of course, is inverse of a student's domain range. Enrolled in master is a sub property. Enrolled in PhD, again, a sub property of enrolled with the range restricted as PhD course and so on. Uh, as teacher, domain course, range teacher, inverse of teaches and so on. So everything we did here, so is grouped into object properties, data properties, classes, which is the easiest one class, subclass, you see where we add restrictions, uh, we are saying that it's a subclass of student, but it's also a subclass of a restriction, and this restriction is a restriction of a property called degree level, taking values from a string. And then we have the list of individuals, <laughs> individuals which are of type, right now the types uh, uh, ER, okay, there's a predefined uh, named individual, but it's also of type teacher, which is the type I declare. Again, our planet is of type teacher, semantic web is of type course, student one is of type student, and so on. So everything we wrote there actually is uh, it described in RDF. The only thing that makes it an ontology is that we are using classes or nodes and relationships for, from the whole namespace. And to this namespace, some specific meaning is assigned. Okay? And uh, we'll see what's the meaning of this uh, or how. Oh, we won't see the details, otherwise, it would uh, be crazy. But uh, we have a, an idea of uh, what, what the the, the formal aspects uh, of using this. Hmm? So every everything with all uh, actually has a mathematical foundation that will enable reasoning. So next time we'll try to see, well, next time Luigi will come and uh, create an ontology with you, give you a practical, let's say, um, workflow for creating a new, a new ontology. And then the following time, the next time, we'll see how to reason about existing ontologies. Okay, or we read you already do some basic reasoning just to check the integrity and the consistency of what you write, and then we'll try to understand the, how it happens and what happens when you read. Okay, I will stop here. I'll give you a 15 minutes break, and then later on we have the exercise on uh, querying Spark SparkQL. We hope uh, it seems that the uh, internet today is, now is working because this morning we had a lot of problems, but uh, let's try to do that. Uh, at uh, 12.10, okay?